I could see she lift her head and kind of snap back and looked over to the corner. And there, sure enough, was a buck that I had photos of, never seen a person. He was coming out to feed too. And I had to choose at that moment what to do because I could either take the personal you know, choice and shoot that buck or I could help this farmer out who really wanted to reduce the deer numbers on there. And I've been telling him we need to shoot a lot of does. I had a hard choice. Do I shoot this three and a half year old buck who's about like mid 120s or do I shoot the doe that I had a clean shot on right then, right there. And the buck was not really in position yet. So I ultimately ended up deciding to shoot. Big Buck Registries Deer Hunting Podcast, episode number 226. Matt Ross, QDMA, select tree cutting for deer habitat and balancing the herd. Please support our sponsors as they make this show possible. Today's show is sponsored by Black Ash Outdoor Products. Reduce your risk of tree stand suspension trauma with a tree stand wingman, the tree stand emergency descender system. The Enforcer, take control of your odor footprint with your personal ozone generator. The Rack Packer. Don't drag your deer out of the woods like a caveman. Never drag a deer again. No need to kill yourself dragging a deer when there's the Rack Packer. Use the promo code BIGBUCK, B-I-G-B-U-C-K, at checkout to earn free shipping at $23 value. Go to therackpacker.com. Covert Scouting Cameras, remote cameras for hunting, wildlife, and security. The Horny Buck Seed Company, it's all about the freshest seed. Morse's Sporting Goods, a full line of sporting goods without the sales tax. Northwoods Common Sense. New England's finest white-tailed deer lures, 100% fresh, pure, and undiluted. And Big Buck merch. For only $19.99, you can get a cool, high-quality Big Buck t-shirt and show support for this podcast by visiting www.bigbuckregistry.com forward slash M-E-R-C-H. Big Buck Registry is a virtual museum of hunting stories. We preserve a piece of Americana by interviewing and recording hunters about their hunts and experiences from across the country. And who knows, maybe we'll learn a thing or two along the way that'll help us take our hunt to the next level. Hi, this is Barry Wenzel from Brothers of the Bow and Trophy Whitetail Boot Camps. I'm not really sure what a podcast is, but you're about to push play on what is now my favorite podcast, Big Buck Registry's Deer Hunting Podcast. Hello, this is Cuz Strickland with Mossy Oak, and you're about to listen to the podcast that I listen to 16 and a half hours nonstop. The Big Buck Registry is the best out there. Hey, everyone. This is Nikki Boxford from Winchester Life. Get ready to press play on my favorite podcast, Big Buck Registry's Deer Hunting Podcast. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, fellow predators. My name is Jay, and thank you for tuning in to the Big Buck Registry's Deer Hunting Podcast. For Dusty Phillips and Jim Keller and the entire staff here at the Big Buck Registry, welcome to this week's show. There are a couple things I'd like you to do for us if you could. If you would, please check us out on iTunes, subscribe, and leave us a review. With your help, we're going to try and push this show up the iTunes charts. I know we have a lot of listeners out there, and I need you to take some action. I need you to leave a review and subscribe to the show. If you do subscribe, that'll give you access and notification each and every week that a new show is released. You can also access this show in its entirety on YouTube, Stitcher, TuneIn Radio, iHeartRadio, and Google Play. It's all right there for you to access on demand at your fingertips. Regarding the harness program, we have an ample supply of harnesses to give away from our volunteer donors. If you're in need of a full-body harness, please send an email to j at bigbuckregistry.com. We wanted to know more about select tree cutting for deer habitat, so we turned to our friend from the Quality Deer Management Association, Matt Ross. The conversation became more than a tree cutting exercise as we explored the history of QDMA, deer herd balance, proper doe to buck ratios, quantitative herd analysis, deer plants, and overall deer habitat. Matt Ross is a certified wildlife biologist and licensed forester. He received his bachelor's in wildlife conservation from the University of Massachusetts at Amherst and his Master's of Wildlife Management from the University of New Hampshire. Before joining the QDMA staff, Matt worked for a natural resource consulting firm in southern New Hampshire, and he was a QDMA volunteer and branch officer, and is now QDMA's Assistant Director of Conservation. 
We'll turn to our interview with Matt Ross in just a moment. But before we do, let's turn to Jim Keller with the Deer News. For the Big Buck Registry, this is Jim Keller with the Deer News. Our first story this week, bucks caught battling an Illinois construction site. This story is from the foxnews.com website. Two bucks would not buckle when they were caught on video battling it out in an Illinois construction site last weekend. Veronica Winchester told WQAD she was driving to a construction site in Moline last Saturday when she spotted a woman flagging down drivers to watch the strange animal encounter. Winchester and the drivers then watched the two white-tailed deer ramming their antlers into each other in a fight in the woods that spilled out into the street. She grabbed her phone and recorded the fight. Ed Cross from the Illinois Department of Natural Resources told WQAD that October is the height of rutting season for white-tailed deer in the state. They're very competitive, like dudes playing fantasy football, Cross said. He added that the deer can also die while locking antlers because they get so entangled that they get stuck and end up dying of starvation. It, it, he added, it can happen, but it's very rare. Monster white-tailed deer called a legend taken in North Dakota. This story is from the Minot Daily News website, as reported by Kim Fundingsland. Kyle Haas of Bow Bells, North Dakota, harvested a monster of a non-typical white-tailed deer during the season opener last Friday. His dad was there, too, and his best friend. Quality company made an exciting hunt even more memorable. As for the deer, about as non-typical as you can get, Haas said, it was kind of a freak of nature to even have the thing around. Non-typical white-tailed deer are not completely unusual in North Dakota. There's a few taken every year. What makes the Haas buck stand out is its large size and the fact that very few people, if any, had previously seen the deer in the area only about 12 miles south of the Canadian border and 52 miles northwest of Minot. He was kind of a legend, said Haas. Everybody talked about him, but no one saw him on the hoof, just the sheds. Haas had seen photographs of shed antlers from the past two years that matched the antlers on his deer. Last year, a matching pair of sheds was found west of Kenmare, about six or eight miles south of Bobles. It was further proof that the unique deer was still in the area. Ironically, Haas was targeting mule deer while bow hunting in the Bowbells area when he got his first look at the big non-typical. Haas watched the big deer bed down in a cattail slow and return later that afternoon to attempt a stock. A doe spooked about 30 yards from him, then the buck jumped up but offered no shot for the bow hunter. He was about 50 yards out and took off over the hill. I never thought I'd see him again, remarked Haas, but he would. The very next day, the opening day of the North Dakota deer gun season. When the deer season opened on noon Friday, Haas found himself carefully walking slows in the area where the deer had last been seen. When working through a slow about a half mile from that location, the deer emerged from cover and Haas managed a perfect shot. The buck has 30 points on its antlers. Early estimates of a score are in the 225 range. Of course, no official Boone and Crockett score can be made on the deer until a 60-day drying period expires, but it is all but assured of a lofty place in the North Dakota record book, very probable in the top five non-typical white-tailed deer in state history. Freedom of choice, Wisconsin removes minimum age for hunters. This story is from the DeerAndDeerHunting.com website and was reported by Ellen Clemens. Wisconsin Governor Scott Walker has signed a bill removing the state's minimum age for hunters, giving parents and mentors more ability to choose when their children can begin hunting. Wisconsin's Assembly passed a bill in October to eliminate the state's minimum hunting age. Hunters had to be at least 12 years old to purchase a license or hunt with a gun unless they were in a mentored hunt. In those mentored hunting programs or events, children as young as 10 could hunt. The bill would eliminate the age minimum and allow anyone of any age to hunt in a mentored hunt. It was passed by the Assembly on a 57-32 vote by a 21-12 margin in the Senate. Walker signed the bill on November 11th. The minimum age requirements varies from state to state. The Wisconsin Hunters' Rights Coalition says 34 states, now 35 with Walker's move, have no minimum age. Some have no requirements allowing parents or guardians to determine at what age their children may hunt with them, others, or by themselves. Other states have different ages, with some, such as Wisconsin, combining age requirements with mentored hunts or programs. That concludes this week's edition of the Big Buck Registry's Deer News. Special thanks to Daniel Applebaum for the lead on one of today's stories. For links to the stories featured this week, please check our show notes at www.bigbuckregistry.com. If you have any ideas for future topics or have questions about any of these topics, please email me at jim at bigbuckregistry.com. For the Big Buck Registry, this is Jim Keller with the Deer News. Well, thanks to Jim Keller for the Deer News. Without further ado, here is Matt Ross. 
Matt Ross, welcome to the Big Buck Registry's Deer Hunting Podcast. How are you, my friend? Very good. Thanks for having me today. I'm psyched to have you on, man. QDMA is exactly the kind of stuff we're interested in, and uh, you're a big part of that, so I want to pick your brain for a little while, if that's cool. That is very cool. We're, it's, the, it's the time of year to be talking about this stuff, that's right. Time, to, time of the year to be talking about this stuff and the time of the year to be doing this stuff. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> yep. yep. Excellent. Where, where are you from, Matt? I, I am from New York. Um, I actually live in New York State, um, Saratoga County, which is uh, not too far from the, the Vermont border. Um, I grew up in a just a little bit south of here, Dutchess County, but uh, my wife and I settled and lived near where she grew up. So uh, like the area, it's not far from where she works and uh, some good deer hunting. It's a pretty ag-rich area, a lot of dairy farms, so it's, it's, it's a lot of fun. And I actually knew... Um, some folks in this area while we were moving um, just through QDMA, just through my own uh, efforts working there that uh, I kind of fell into a nice group of uh, hunting buddies as soon as we moved. But uh, we we had been uh, all around the Northeast before that. But that's where I live and I'm from New York State. Gotcha. Isn't it funny how uh, you you tend to find good deer hunting buddies quickly? Yeah, that's right. It is. it's, It's easy to do. I remember the discussion we were, you know, thinking about moving and it came up, you know, immediately, probably not on the forefront of her mind, but I was like, I'm like, actually, there's pretty good deer hunting over there. And I know some guys over in that direction. <laughs> yeah. I, I think uh, part of the reason I moved to the town I live in was because of a, a, a deer hunting friend of mine lived just up the road and uh, it's, it's worked out pretty well. Of course, he moved to North Carolina since. So now I, now I get to oh. travel down there to hunt, but it's, uh. It, it's it, yeah deer hunting consumes your life in more ways than you really think uh it does including where pretty much every day of the year <laughs> yeah exactly yep so what is your role with qdma well uh, i it's changed over the years but my current title is assistant director of conservation okay um so i work in our conservation department uh, i oversee uh, a, a number of our field staff and they have different roles across the country um i run a couple of our programs that we have. Um, some of them are educationally uh, based. We have a couple classes, trainings that you can take if you're a landowner hunter and you want to learn more about QDM. We have a, a program um, that you can get your property certified or inspected by somebody that can come and give you site-specific advice. Um, I work with my supervisor, Kip Adams. He's got a strong tie to New Hampshire, where, where you're from, as, as do I. Um, and Kip, uh, over, he's the director of the conservation department. We co-write with a bunch of other of QDMA staff um, our annual whitetail report. That's actually kind of uh, what we do this time of year. We we kind of we look at the m- most current harvest data available from around the country and make some predictions and analyses based on what we're seeing. So it's kind of it's a national perspective on what's going on in the world of deer issues. Um, disease outbreaks. Uh, it's our version of the State of the Union. That's something we do this time of year. It's a good time to be writing that because it's on the forefront of everybody's minds, deer season. So uh, that comes out in early in the year. Um, and a whole laundry list of other uh, responsibilities. But th- those are some of the larger things that I do. Um, Kip and I and our staff oversee a lot of the um, outreach and education that we do. And that's what QDMA has been known for. It's uh, about to be our 30th anniversary. We were founded in 1988, so next year will be our 30th anniversary, and that's what we do. I mean, we have there's millions of deer hunters out there. Um, we do our fair share of land conservation and, and other things, but it's not like deer are at the brink of population numbers where there's not enough of them. Like some of the other conservation organizations are, are well known and, and respected, and they do great jobs with bringing populations back, mm-hmm. protecting land. That's not that's QDMA's role is basically taking the the militia of deer hunters out there, educating them, the landowners about what is the proper way to manage a deer herd so that it's healthy, um, that we're we're not causing damage to the environment. Um, it's all surrounding the QDM philosophy that a, a lot of hunters practice. Um, we wish more of them were QDMA members, which is uh, the group I work for, but there's just a vast number of, of hunters out there that practice QDM, 
and uh, we help dispel some myths and get the right information in the right hands. It's all science based, and so our our efforts as an organization, our mission is to um, enhance that education, um, make sure our hunting heritage is protected, uh, make sure access is still open to hunters, uh, make sure we're recruiting new hunters, and we oversee a lot of the things that that. Um, fall within those mission goals. Gotcha. What, uh, and, and maybe you haven't been with the organization long enough, but what was the intent back in 88 to, to get this thing off the ground? Why did they feel that it was necessary to start this organization? Oh, it's a great question. Uh, yeah, I've been actually with the organization for going to be, I think, my 12th year this spring. So a while, but uh, certainly not all 30 years. Um, the, the QDMA was formed, really, the intent was a small regional effort to begin with. Um, the founder of QDMA is Joe Hamilton. He was a, uh, a biologist and still is, but he was a state agency biologist. He worked with hundreds, I think six, seven, eight hundred hunt clubs, um, down in South Carolina. And, uh, initially, um, it started as a way to communicate what QDM was to all of these different clubs. So we formed the South Carolina Quality Deer Management Association. It was meant to be a regional effort. And hmm. Joe had been um, enlightened, I guess is the right word, and read a book from uh, an author out of Texas. Um, the book was called Producing Quality Whitetails. And um, the author of that, one of the two authors he became friends with and still is today, um, but through the professional kind of chain of command of t- talking to this other biologist, he learned about, you know, what QDM was, its its purpose. Um, really, its uh, purpose is when you're historically the way we, we used to hunt deer and still do in some places in the country. It's really changed, though. There's been a big culture shift over the last 20, 30 years. And I think a lot of the reason is because of QDMA and the QDM movement. But, um, you know, h- historically, hunters would go afield and it was kind of the badge of honor to, to shoot a buck, any buck. So we, we, as a group, as, as deer hunters really hit the, the buck segment of the deer herd hard. And, uh, when you over harvest one side of the, the coin, um, particularly with bucks, we drove age structures down so that the average age of a buck in the country that was being killed was, was young. I mean, back in 88, it was like 60%, 62% of all bucks killed in the United States were one year olds. Right. Um, and South Carolina, it was, uh, and, and still is in those areas, you know, it was, it, it was very common. Hunters would go out, they'd kill a buck, even if it was a young buck, because it was, I went out and got my buck and they rarely shot a doe. And that really stemmed from, you know, you go back another 20, 30 years before that, where we were at a point in wildlife management history where, uh, agencies were trying to build deer herds up, bring them back. I mean, a lot of places, even South Carolina, they were restocking deer. Deer just populations were non-existent or very low back in the, you know, forties and fifties that they were bringing deer down from Wisconsin and New York, where, where I live Mm -hmm. down to those States. So it made sense when they started regulating hunting, you were told as a hunter, don't shoot does. They're the ones that are giving birth, obviously, and we want to build deer herds up. So that, um, cultural perspective of deer hunters lasted for long enough that it became kind of a taboo. You don't shoot does and you go out and you kill a buck, but too much of a good thing. People really abstain from doe harvesting to the point where populations got very high and were detrimental to the, to the environment and uh, buck populations on uh, the other side were driven to very young age structures. And a lot of things get kind of biologically messed up when you do that deer are social animals. They're meant to have a nice balanced age structure. So Joe learned about all this, read this book, became fast friends with um, Al Brothers, the author of that, that book I mentioned, and wanted to get the clubs in his part of South Carolina that he helped manage their properties to start practicing QDM. So he formed this group and started a newsletter to go out to all these clubs. He used to age jawbones for them and um, work with them on their management on the properties and the newsletter became very popular and the concept grew and it soon went from a regional after effort within the state of South Carolina to all of South Carolina. Then it grew to a like kind of Southeastern thing. Then it grew out to 
we were actually at one point called the North American Quality Deer Management Association, mm. or or uh, and at some point just dropped that part and it became QDMA because now we're international in different countries and and others. So uh, it became kind of like a, a a fire, you know. There's a flame that burned across the U.S. and w- there's a couple of biological indicators we feel like really we can raise the mission accomplished sign that has happened in the very recent years. Um, 1999 was the first year in history in the United States that deer hunters shot more antlerless deer does than they did bucks, um, or at least a balance of them. So it took until 1999 from really the 20s, or even before that, before regulated deer hunting occurred, where hunters would go out and try to balance deer herds by shooting enough does. Now it's common. A lot of hunters understand I got to do that. That's part of my responsibility. But 99 is not that long ago. That was the first year. And every year since, there's been a good balance uh, of uh, does taken to bucks. And that's that's a nice feather in our cap as deer hunters. And then the second is uh, that percentage I mentioned earlier, the 62% yearling bucks in the harvest back in 88. Yep. That is pretty much every year dropped a little bit, a couple percentage points. And that's because more and more and more hunters understand the, the kind of the, the mentality of, you know, you let them get a little older. And obviously part of that is antler driven to get bigger antlers, so part of its body size you know, get bigger body deer. People want to shoot mature bucks. That's that's part of our nature. I mean, you can't avoid that. Um, but that percentage point has precipitously dropped in the past 30 years to the point where we can now claim, really, I mean, the last last uh, data is showing this, that there are now three-and-a-half-year-old bucks killed in the national harvest. I'm not just talking about New York or New Hampshire where you are. I'm talking about nationally mm-hmm. killed in the U.S. than there are yearlings. So now that percentage is down in the 30s, 32, 33, 34% of the harvest is made up of yearlings. And there's that much or more that are three-year-old killed, 32, 33, 34, 35% are, are three, which means we as hunters have balanced the national herd of deer out there. There are just as many one-year-olds as there are two as there are three or older. There's There's a good balance to the age structure. And that's a really nice accomplishment. And that's that's because of QDM, and it's because of QDMA. Gotcha. I I love that nationally the numbers of yearling bucks that are being taken are dwindling. I love that. However, when I look at local Facebook pages that represent check-in stations, I can't help but notice, specifically because I'm super aware of this stuff now, that it seems anecdotally that 95% of the bucks – being posted are yearlings. Granted, there's some does in the mix, but very, very few older bucks. Does that indicate that there are, or that there is more work to be done, or is this the balance that you'd like to see? Uh, that's a great question, um, and it, it, you know, that's a lot of that is anecdotal, as you mentioned. Uh, we don't think that there's always going to be work to be done, but. We'll never, and we should never have to be at a point where there's zero percent yearlings killed. That that is not the point of QDM. So for the individuals out there at this point that take yearling bucks, if you're a seasoned hunter and that's just your choice, or you're a new hunter and you're a youth or a brand new uh, non-traditional adult hunter that you know wants to take up deer hunting, we we need more hunters in our ranks. Um, a lot of people think you know a deer hunter saying that's crazy, but we are losing hunters. And actually some of the data that just came out from the U S fish and wildlife service has seen the largest drop in the last five year term in history of deer hunters. We're down like 2 million deer hunters. I saw that. That's it's disturbing. Significant. It's, it's scary. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I say all that because if somebody that's listening to this says, this guy's full of it, I don't, I don't want it. You know, I don't want to hear this whole QDM slander, I guess, because I like to kill whatever deer I see, you know, in all honesty, in, in many parts of the country, not all, that's okay because there are that many or more hunters, as we're seeing by the data I'm saying, you know, I just said a few minutes ago, that are choosing to let those kinds of bucks go. So there's balance. Right now the deer herd is balanced. When you're talking about in cases, 
in the seventies and eighties, you know, I'll use Pennsylvania. They're, they're typically used as the example and I'm sure Pennsylvanians hate it, but at one point in Pennsylvania, this isn't the case now, but, um, many, many of the bucks were killed opening weekend and they'd be in the 80, 90% range where there were yearlings. I mean, you're talking about almost no bucks in that, in the entire state that are two or three years old. I mean, most bucks in that state were one, right. um, that, that, that has complications. That's not the case. Pennsylvania's a different world today. It's a well-managed in terms of age structure. There's a very good balance in Pennsylvania. Okay. Um, but whether there's regulatory restrictions on hunters or people's just doing it by free choice. There's just a lot more hunters today that you are, I guess, like-minded to you and I and some of these listeners that, hey, you know what? I, I choose to pass up a young buck or my state is telling me I shouldn't shoot that. Um, in some states, it's mandated. Some states, it's encouraged. Um, and really, there's hunters everywhere that if somebody chooses and it's legal to take a, a yearling buck, there's probably two or three other bucks out there for every one of those that are making it because somebody's letting them go. Um, so we, we don't think that there's always going to be work to be done on the educational side with a lot of things, not necessarily just age structure. I mean, hunters are as better informed today than they used to be ever. I mean, hunters are really sharp. They, they read, there's access to information through podcasts like yourselves and others through the web that hunters are just way more in the know than they used to be. Um, it's no longer the, um, the day of, I go out and spend a week or weekend out a year. And it's, it's the, the tradition still there, but hunters want more. They, they seek it. They, 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 they go out looking for it and they're just better educated that the percent of yearlings in the harvest, we think it pro has probably about stabilized. It may go down a little bit more, but it probably won't. And does it need to, um, you know, I'm sure there's some listeners, some of my buddies that would say, yes, it still needs to go down. And there's probably small pockets here, or there in the country. And you may live in one if you're listening that, yeah, you know, locally, most bucks that are being killed are probably yearlings and there could be work done in those areas. And we, we need to identify them and work with those landowners and hunters in those areas. But nationally, when you look at a very, very large scale, you know, um, we're in a good place. And uh, is it going to improve much more than this? It might, but it might not need to. I mean, it's just a very different world today than it used to be in the 70s and 80s. Okay. Um, you know, you just watch and read anything in the popular hunting media, and people are talking about ages of bucks. You know, I, I saw that three-year-old, or I saw, you know, uh, that buck's six years old. I have trail camera pictures. That's just that conversation's awesome because people are, are taking account for what's out there. I, I think it's good. Okay. Gotcha. How much involvement does QDMA have with state agencies, fish and game departments to help discuss and maybe even help regulators regulate certain size restrictions and things of that nature? Uh, obviously the state's requirements are much far less than what QDMA would probably recommend is my guess. Um, how much do you get involved? We're pretty involved. I mean, we have through, through a couple of different avenues. Um, we certainly are not a regulatory organization, right? Um, we're a nonprofit conservation group, just like all the other ones out there. I mean, that's, we we're member based people join and they join because they want to learn and they want to give back to their heritage and, you know, the conservation that's involved with deer hunting. That's what, that's what we do. But we, we have very good relationships with all the state agencies. Um, the white tail report I mentioned earlier, that data comes from the state agencies. Um, we do a survey every year. We send that to each state agency's deer biologist. They provide us the latest snapshot of harvest data, what, what their, you know, data looks like. And then we compile all of that. And uh, if we didn't have good relationships with them, um, they wouldn't provide that because they're not required to. But pretty much all states uh, send us at least some, if not all, the data we ask for. And, and uh, we attend. There are regional meetings uh, for all of the different agencies. We're invited and attend those. We collaborate with them on multiple levels. In some cases, as an example, we collaborate heavily with them. We even have co-funded employees in a couple states where the state agency pays part of the salary, we pay part of the salary, 
um, and, and in some cases, those employees are housed on a you know at a state agency's office, but they go work with landowners in those states, in Michigan, Missouri, and other places. Um, in, in some parts of the country, uh, our relationship with the state agency folks is a little bit more formalized, and we don't do as much. But so it's kind of a patchwork. But I, I believe we're respected as. Um, an organization, the state agency sees some of the power that, that QDMA has, one of which is we have a voice that they can't. Um, we generally agree with state agencies about management. And when you're talking about managing age structure, that's um, similar, but kind of a different conversation. But, you know, diseases, issues with hunting recruitment, you know, uh, uh, there's so many topics that state agencies routinely will ask for our involvement and we have the ability to you know send a letter to a legislator or commissioner or what have you in that state and say you know QDMA is 60,000 members strong this you know we're 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 run by science I'm a certified wildlife biologist and licensed forester uh Kip is a certified wildlife biologist our founder is a certified wildlife biologist we're, we're we come from a strength of of strong science based um deer biology that we can write and advocate on behalf of a certain issue. Um, and sometimes the state agencies don't even really have the power because they, they can't, but we, we can get involved if it helps. So um, we, we do get and have very good relationships with most state agencies. Okay. Right. And, and we're always looking to, to, to improve on those and make sure that we can be involved and be at the table. And we do actually have a seat at the table in a lot of cases when, when things are discussed. Gotcha. All right. What, what is the perfect harvest balance in the eyes of the QDMA between those and yearlings, two-year-olds, three-year-olds, and so forth? Is there actual a plan? Yeah, there, there is, there's some real data that you can collect off the deer herd that you're you know, harvesting off of to kind of make some uh, uh, calls on. And that's what, you know, your state's wildlife uh, or deer biologist does at a, at a large scale. They'll do that at the state and also at the WMU, the wildlife management unit scale. But you can do that at a property scale. No state manages at the property scale. That's up to the landowner. So if there's somebody listening and they have 20 acres or 40 acres and they're shooting deer off of it or a couple hundred acres, you could take weights and jaw bones and get the ages off a of deer and make some uh, judgments on what needs to be uh, harvested. Even better, one of the hottest things in the world of QDM today is something we call cooperatives, where you have multiple neighboring landowners working together. Nobody gets to cross boundary lines. You don't you don't go hunt on each other's properties, but in these co-ops, um, you know you you all kind of do a over the fence. Hand, uh, handshake before the season say listen you might have a handful of land and i ha- personally hunt on a co-op they're incredibly uh rapidly growing they're all over and in fact some of the employees i mentioned earlier that we have their primary job is to work with and form cooperatives that's that's something they do hmm. but you can have a group of two three four five doesn't you know hundreds in some cases there's like co-ops out there that have a hundred landowner co-ops um, and you have all these neighbors meet before the season and they might say, all right, everybody in the room, um, you know, we won't shoot yearling bucks, one-year-olds next year. Um, everybody make sure you do enough habitat work and we need to kill say 30 does on the collective acreage. You kill two, you try to kill one, you know, whatever it is based on acreage and everybody goes and does their own merry thing during the season. They may meet at the end of the season and they have all that data to work with and say, all right, is it working? Are the, you know, is the buck age structure getting better? Is the uh, weights getting going up? Are deer getting healthier? And uh, yeah, that's something that we teach through our magazine, our membership magazine, through our website. Um, one of those classes I mentioned earlier, the trainings that we put together, that's what we teach people is how to manage. So you, what what's the perfect balance varies. And that's why I'm kind of yep. saying it depends. Right. You might be in a place where uh, the deer herd is inherently very low. The numbers are very low because of um, elevation or habitat quality or, you know, you, in every state there's a wide variety. So in my state, in New York, you can go from the Adirondacks to the agriculturally rich um, southern tier out by the Finger Lakes, that direction, 
very different deer herds you're dealing with. Okay. Same thing where you are, Jay. You know, you have the whites up in the northern part of the state, and you can go down to the Massachusetts border and have a very different population that you're hunting. So every property is different, and you set your prescriptions on what you need to shoot uh, to in, in numbers and what type of deer based on the neighborhood standard and what, what is available, what's, what's the potential. So like for somebody in the northern part of your state, um, if they passed on a yearling buck because they felt like um, they wanted to grow the age structure, I can pretty much guarantee you in parts of the remote areas of northern New Hampshire, um, I know there are some parts of northern New Hampshire where yearling buck fractions are very high, but you know there might be somebody that there's just not a lot of hunters out there. You pass up a yearling buck and might have been, one, you're only shot at a deer that year, right. and two, there's a lot of deer in older age classes that you're not really improving the age structure by, by pass. So that person might say, you know what, you shoot whatever buck you can see. But then there might be another part of the state where the age structure is very imbalanced and it would behoove all the residents if they were all passing yearling bucks. And that's why it's so site specific. Same thing with numbers of deer. You might want to be in a rebuilding phase and, and might be trying to build the population up. So in that circumstance, the prescription might be like, don't shoot any does or very few. And another property could be in a, another area, like, hey, we need to really shoot a lot of does to to bring that population down. So it it very it varies around okay. the country. All right. So let me reverse the question a little bit and go the other way. What in an sure. I- ideal world, understanding that each property is different, but in an ideal world, in an ideal setting, the benchmark that you're trying to achieve, what is the proper balance of existing animals, deer living, gotcha. living on your property that you're trying to get to? So if, if you walked away and let, I guess I hate to say nature take its course, I mean, that's that's uh, not probably the right phrase, but the most natural setting that you can manage for is where you have a, on the buck side, is that you have deer represented in all age classes, some deer. So there are buck fawns, button bucks, there's one-year-olds, there's two-year-olds, there's three-year-olds, and older. Let's just say and older. You, you can even kind of segregate some of those older age classes, you know, four, whatever. But let's just say fawns, one, two, three, four, uh, four and older. Um, so there's, there's, but there are individuals out that represent in all those age classes. That Pennsylvania example I gave you before, mm-hmm. they didn't exist at three and four, and there were probably less than five to 10% of all bucks in the state that were two. That's not balanced. Now, are they, would they be equitable? Would you expect to see if you had five different compartments, there to be 20% in each one? No, that's not reality. The reality is you probably see 40 to 50% be in that fawn one-year-old age class. Half of them would be those first two age classes, at least, because every year fawns are born, and a lot of them are born, and that's where they come from. So in a natural setting, you would see uh, you know, about half of all deer being those youngest age classes, fawns and, and one-year-olds. You'd probably see uh, 20%, you know, 15 to 20%, maybe a little bit higher than that, be in the two-year-old. And then you'd see 10 or so percent in the three. And even in a natural setting where you are really managing for the most advanced age structure, very few bucks live four and older in most parts of the country just because they they die. They die from hunting. They die from disease. They're not meant to be a long-lived species. Deer are meant to, you know, yes, there are examples, and I can cite some of them, where deer live into their teens. But in, in all reality, most deer aren't making it past five, six, or seven. Okay. And the percent that are probably five or older or even four or older is less than 5% of the deer herd and even the best case scenario. So you go to your dream location, you know, you know, your Iowa, say, you yep. know, everybody thinks about Iowa, Northern Missouri, some one of those states, mm-hmm. five, 10% max are going to be in those like highest, oldest age class because they die. Right. That's, that's what they are. Right. Um, on how many does per buck do you want? You know, there's the mythical try to get a one-to-one out there in all reality, probably the, the thing you should be shooting for is, one and a half to two does for every buck on the ground. 
not necessarily you're killing, but that's what's out there. Yep. Um, y- you can get way imbalanced, um, but really it's hard to get a one-to-one. It's, it's, it's pretty difficult. And, uh, you know, a, a, a realistic kind of goal would be to shoot for between one and a half to to one and a half to two does for every buck that's out there. Okay. Hopefully right. that answers your question. It does. Thank you. Yeah. So here's an interesting question and talking about science and just field work. How do you go about counting how, what your doe to buck ratio is? How do you, how do you actually quantitate that? Great question. So there are definite methods that we use to index um, the deer population, and it's a look at year over year. You do this the same way every year, and you look at the trend of how those numbers are changing. So there's a couple of different areas you, cl- you can collect data from as an as a individual hunter. One of the easiest and least expensive t- uh, techniques you can do is as you're hunting, sit down every, or keep a little pad in your, in your pocket or write down in your truck or car when you get there, when you get home, how many hours you hunted, how many deer you saw that were bucks, does, fawns, and how many deer that you identified as a deer, but you couldn't tell if it was a buck, doe, or fawn. And you can use, that's called hunter observation data. Some states collect this Mm -hmm. from from their bow hunters. um, And you can use that data as a, it's free. I mean, you're out there hunting anyway. You just write down what you see as an index of doe to, uh, doe to buck, the kind of ratio of does to bucks on, on the ground. Yep. Um, we tell people one of the best ways to measure what we call fawn recruitment. How good is your doe, is, is your herd reproducing itself? So recruiting fawns into the population. Um, and there are states that actually use the fawn to doe ratio out of their bow hunters um, to, to make an assessment on how productive the deer herd is. That's another thing you can use. Um, it's a little bit more difficult to do age structure from that, but you can, for the most part, because you're making a call on the buck's age from a live look and you don't always know what that deer's age is, although there's techniques, Mm -hmm. but you can, you can try to make an assessment on age structure from that. It's generally not recommended. Another way people do this in states where it's legal to bait or put feed down is do a, a formal trail camera survey. You put bait down, you put a camera on it. This is before the season starts, usually late summer, early fall, you run it for two weeks and you take all those photos and you can crunch basically the same data I just told you about, mm-hmm. you know, bucks, fawns, does, and get that off of that. Um, another technique is at the, at the skinning shed. When you shoot a deer, you take a jawbone and a weight off of every deer. You can check whether or not the doe has milk in her udder to look at reproductive capabilities. And there's a lot of really good data you can get off of the deer you're shooting that tells you what's going on with the deer herd. So there are a lot of different ways that the average person can collect this data. And that's what we do. We have books, posters, like I said, that class, we teach people how to collect that information so they can make those calls for their property or for their co-op. And it's good to look at a larger scale and say, all right, what's the state want to do in my neck of the woods? A lot of times they'll put out goals by WMU. They might be trying to reduce or grow a deer herd. You can look to see how your property compares to you know, the state agency's perspective, if they're trying to shrink the deer herd in your area and your observation and trail camera d- data is telling you, yeah, we have a lot of deer, it confirms that and just say, all right, you know, I think we need to shoot X number of deer. And there are, we talked, we talked to folks about um, productivity models mm-hmm. that tell you how many deer you need to, to shoot. I'll just throw a rough number for the listeners here. But in general, if you have a, a herd that's pr- has good productivity. It's re- it's replacing itself, and the fawn recruitment's a good number. You don't have many major issues with disease or winter, which I know that where we live um, is the case in some places. Predators, poaching. If you don't have like abnormal loss, you know, in the, uh, year over year, you need to if you need to re- to reduce a deer herd. You basically have to take between 20 to 30 percent minimum of the does from the population just to stabilize that population's growth. So if you're in, if you're a listener and you're in an area that has a highly productive deer, there's lots of fawns on the ground, you don't have major issues with like a disease outbreak or winter kill or something like that, 
and you feel like, hey, we need to reduce the number of deer out here, there's just too many, make an estimate based on the data we were just talking about mm -hmm. on how many does you think are on the property. Okay. You can do that through a trail camera survey. You might say, I have 100 acres, and I think there are six does on my property. If you remove 20 to 30%, so, so at least two or three does, you stabilize that population from growing. It no longer will grow. So you have to exceed that 20 to 30%. That's a real rough napkin math, but you can do that at whatever scale based on same thing. If you think you need to grow your deer herd, just say, well, listen, I think there are six does out there. We can't kill more than two. I want this deer herd to grow. So that's, that's how that math is done. Gotcha. Okay. All right. That makes sense. So your background it goes back to receiving a bachelor's degree in wildlife conservation at the University of Massachusetts, followed up by a master's degree in wildlife at the University of New Hampshire, which is also my alma mater. Ah, nice. It, it's very rare to find somebody that's working in the field of which they studied these days. So how did you develop your your uh, passion for conservation. It sounds like it goes back to your, your youth, uh, your childhood even, um, and still managed to end up with a job in the actual studies that you, you partook in back in college. <laughs> yeah. I, I, in terms of ending up with a job in a, in a field that you got a degree in. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I agree. I don't know that I, I have little kids that are way too young to be thinking about college quite yet, but, uh, you know, I, I don't know the average person that's making it, but yeah, it does go back to my youth and really goes back to deer hunting, Jay. I mean, like I, I grew up in a family that, you know, my dad deer hunted. I have two brothers. Neat, both of them were introduced to deer hunting, but, um, and understand it, they get it, they eat venison, but they just never really picked up deer hunting. But for some reason, you know, I sunk my teeth into it literally figuratively, however, and I loved it. I couldn't get enough of deer hunting. When I was able to drive myself, I would go bow hunt by myself. I had my own car, you know, I spent as much time outside as possible. And at a fairly young age, I decided I want to do something in the deer hunting world. And I know there's a, probably millions of kids that feel the same way. They love deer hunting. Um, I, I also have kind of a nerdy sciencey mind. I mean, I like data. I like I, I like spreadsheets, hate to say it, but I do. I mean, I think it's a really cool thing. So if it, it fit, fit well with me, and uh, I really started be because of deer hunting and said, all right, well, what can I do? And you go through the Rolodex of jobs out there. Um, QDMA has some good um, blogs on our website about careers for deer hunters. And you can end up in a, in a couple different directions. Um, but I knew I wanted to do something biology, deer biology related, and um, looked at schools that had good wildlife programs, um, you know, being – 17, 18, you know, at that point when you're looking at school, uh, I, I wanted to move away from home, but not super far away, you know, far enough away. Everybody mm -hmm. goes through that. So yep, right. I looked at schools in the Northeast. I wasn't going to move to probably the Southeast or Midwest or anything. I wanted to be somewhere that was a couple hours away right. and, uh, I chose UMass. It was a great school. I, I loved going to UMass and, um, uh, came back home after undergrad. I actually worked seasonally as a technician, for the New York DEC for a couple of years on and off. So I was a wildlife tech. I did deer check stations and some other non-game work. I actually did some pretty neat stuff with peregrine falcons and, and others in the DEC regional office. But, and then on the side, I painted, you know, painted houses. That was sure. my life at then. And I, I knew that I, and I had been told from an early age going into school that you should get a master's degree. It's kind of a minimum. So I, I applied and ended up going to UNH. UNH at the time, uh, you, I don't know if you knew this or not, but doesn't have it anymore. You used to have a research facility in Brentwood, New Hampshire. Yeah, you know where that is? I do. I certainly do. Yeah. yeah Brent, Brentwood uh, had a captive deer, turkey, and some other animals uh, facility there. State owns it. I'm not sure what they're doing with the, with the land now, but it closed down a couple years after I graduated and left. But hmm. I knew about that facility. There was some pretty cool research coming out of there. So, um, ended up going to UNH and, um, I ran that facility, pretty interesting experience getting up every day and feeding 40 to 50 deer before you go into class. But, um, <laughs> right. that's where I went. And I actually graduated and 
got a job with a consulting company in uh, southeastern New Hampshire that did forestry and wildlife management, private consultant that owns a, a company and worked with landowners and towns and wrote management plans and did a lot of forestry work, but I was hired as a um, following a, my best friend had had a job there and he actually moved on to the cooperative extension service. He still works there. Um, but there was a job opening for the wildlife biologists on staff and I was hired there and in my tenure working for that gentleman in that company um, had done some forestry work for not forestry work, but I'd taken some forestry classes um, and got a minor in it. I actually ended up doing a lot of forestry work, working for that consulting company to the point where I got licensed. So I'm actually a licensed forester in New Hampshire. And that was a, for somebody that manages natural resources was an amazing experience to kind of follow the, the ball to see, I mean, everybody knows that, that when you go disturb the, the forest, you do a clear cut. Sometimes hunters get upset. Sometimes they love it. It changes what deer do, right? right. Hunters know that. Right. You go in, you you do things to, to the environment, and animals respond. One of the most rewarding experiences I've had as a professional was to come out of academia as a, you know, a, a student doing research to real-world practical application where we would prescribe something to, to happen on a property with either wildlife or forestry objectives. You know, if the landowner said, I really want to make money, please like, let's cut the timber in a way where I can continue making money or I, it's a liquidation. I want to make all my money now or whatever. Or if they had wildlife objectives and said, I want to make this a premier hunting spot or what have you say, all right, well, here are the things that we have at our disposable at our disposal. Let's go do them. And we'd, we'd, contract that work and do it to the forest. We'd clear it, we'd cut it in one way or, or another or do what have you. And then to see an immediate response the year or two or three afterwards and watch how animals and deer particularly would respond to that, man, I, I, I feel that was an education that I could have never got in school. And I'm sure a lot of people hearing this can relate, you know, metaphorically to their careers. Right. That was like, it was it was an amazing experience, and not only that, the guy I worked for had been in business long enough that I'd also been assigned to do work on properties that he had treated ten or fifteen years earlier. So I almost had the ability to hit a fast forward button and say, "Oh, okay, he did this back in you know 1982. Now that's what it looks like. So if I do this on this other guy's property." I know in 15 years, that's what it's going to look like. And that, that was a really cool experience to, to do all that. Gotcha. So I, I worked for that consulting company and, uh, I mentioned Kip Adams before, uh, Kip used to be, I don't know if he's been on your show or not, but he used to be the deer and bear biologist in the state of New Hampshire. And he left and came to QDMA hmm. and I was in grad school at the time when he left. So because my graduate work was funded by the New Hampshire Fish and Game Department. Yep. He served on my advisory committee as the deer biologist. And that was actually one of my first introductions to Kip was he was on my committee and then left to go work for this company called QDMA, which I had never heard of before. And so uh, one, it was kind of a loss for me because he was a, a great biologist. But two, I was introduced to this, this nonprofit deer group. And I said, where have they been? So I joined <laughs> right. and uh, I was actually a member for several years and a friend and I started a local branch of QDMA. That's what we call our local volunteers. That branch still exists in New Hampshire today. Mm -hmm. That was a long time ago. I mean, it's different people leading it, but um, started a branch and I was a volunteer member for several years and eventually a job opened up and um, I decided to to take it and or take a shot at it and they offered me a job and I've I've changed roles at QDMA in the, the almost 12 years since I've been here but that's kind of the history of how I was in New Hampshire. Gotcha. Very good. It's uh it's funny you mentioned Kip because I was aware of his connection to New Hampshire and as a podcaster 
Well, as just as a person, I have a few hit lists. Uh, one of my hit lists is people to interview. Kip is on that list, um, and I have my my buck hit list, and I also have you know my my bucket list of the things I must do before I die. So yeah, <laughs> some of them intertwine. So yeah, Kip is on the list. I do need to interview interview him somewhere down the road. Good deal. So you you became a licensed forester, and one of the reasons that we wanted to have you on the show specifically was about select cr- tree cutting for deer habitat, and that's more one of your specialties, from what I understand. Yeah, yeah, I'm happy to chat about anything forestry related. It's certainly one of my um, uh, loves is uh, working with the forest. So. As I mean, this this could apply on all different levels. It could be state, could be just individual pieces of property. So let's let's just start with a, like, like just somebody owns hundred acres. What what do you go and do to evaluate those hundred acres relative to cutting the proper trees? Well, on an evaluation stage, so if you're interested in looking at your property and the primary objective is deer, um, one of the first things you do before you even walk it, before you even look at trees at that level, is get above the trees, get high up through an aerial photo and start looking at how, um, one, the property fits within the larger context of the landscape. Um, Like if, an example, uh, if you're in a highly forested state like New Hampshire, um, second most forested state in the country. I think it's like 84% of the state of New Hampshire is forested. Maine Maine beats it out. That's right. right. And you get up high up and you're looking at, you know, a couple square miles around. Your property is in the center of the picture, but it's a couple square miles. And 84 to to 90% of the photo is filled up with solid forest. Your property is no different than the rest. So you, you, want to use that context to make your property offer something that might be a requirement of deer Mm -hmm. that might be needed that might not be available in that bigger picture. So you can start using that comparison to, to make some decisions at a very high level. Then the second thing you do is look at the composition of the property within your boundaries. So Zoom in a little bit more where the boundary lines fill the picture, mm-hmm. and uh, it, how diverse is the property? Is it is it pretty much a, a homogeneous look across all things? Is it all the same type? Um, is it broken up a lot? Uh, what's the the age of the forest? Is it primarily a very where there are trees? Is it primarily all the same age trees? Is it pretty much the same species of trees everywhere you look? Deer like if you were to take a jigsaw puzzle and kind of break up the pieces and spread them apart, you know, a little bit more of a broken up look at a property. So you want to bisect and cut up and make your property as diverse as possible where there are pockets of openings and larger openings and smaller openings. And you have forests of different ages and forests that provide different, if you have the space for this, you know, different species. You want early successional habitat. That's where you say you have a field and you let succession march on. You don't mow the field. You don't do anything to it. And you come back in two or three years, you can pretty much picture a brambly, brushy, thick area. That is a a component of the environment that is very lacking, at least in the Northeast in a lot of areas, parts of the Midwest too, because of um, some of the incentive programs out there to, to keep things either um, you know, CRP is one of those programs people relate to that conservation reserve program. There have been times where CRP allocation is very high. There are times when it's very low. But you know, in that brushy environment, that's a, a requirement of a lot of wildlife. Deer use it. Mm-hmm. And then, how about those places that have trees but they're not that old? You know, like a clear cut that's seven or eight or nine years old. So if you can dice up your property based on the soils, how wet they are, the quality of soil, the terrain, you know, and make your property diverse. And then also use that within the context of the bigger picture of that, you know, assessment we talked about a minute ago, you're, you're, you're doing a good uh, start. Then you hit the ground. Then you drive around your pickup or walk around or drive that side by side around the property and start making some of those decisions at the ground level that you did 
you're, you're ground truthing in essence. You mm-hmm. make some decisions on an aerial that you want to make it look X, Y, or Z, and then you go and look at the ground and say, okay, is that possible? I wanted a really brushy open area over here. Is that possible? You drive over there and you look at it. It might be really wet. You know, it could be a spot that would hold cattails, but not, not really successional habitat. So you start fine tuning your decisions, but that, that's how you do that. And all within the context of knowledge of how deer behave. Deer like uh, security cover. They like thick growth that is six feet ground down and lower. That's where they'll spend a lot of daylight hours. You know, they don't feel exposed. Mm-hmm. Where they'll bed. If you can uh, direct deer movement, and we're, we'll get to the selection, you know, system cutting, I guess, here in a second. That's just sure. one tool. But it, if you can say... Based on you know how you access the property, how the wind goes across the property, or if you don't, you figure that stuff out, the primary wind direction and how you go in and out each time, you can start making decisions. Say, well, I know I can't change the wind. Mostly, you know, the wind is coming primarily out of the west, northwest, um, and I access it from the south. I would really love it if the deer bedded in the northwest corner and they walked, you know, uh, to the southeast corner so that I, the wind is always in my favor. So I'm going to make it really brushy up in that northwest corner so they want to bed there, and I'm going to put a food plot in the center to southeast corner, and then I make the deer walk this direction, and I put all my stands on, on this side. You start, that's one example, but you can do that and sculpt a property yep. based on habitat okay. uh, manipulation and, and, and making those decisions. So selectively cutting trees is one of those, um, picking trees out. And uh, uh, tell me a little bit more about what you're thinking, but there are there are ways that you can open up the canopy okay. a little bit to get sunlight in there, to get un, you know brush to grow through something we call selection system management, where you're selectively t- taking trees okay. um, to, to to help that. And there, there's actually some justification to have some of your property not touched, so it's you know it's sparse in the understory, and deer don't want to be there that very much. You know, you provide provide areas of avoidance that deer don't go where you might need to, to get back and forth to stands. Right. Gotcha. So what are you thinking with, uh, with that part of the, well, it's, it's interesting. You say that, you know, I'm just thinking about, you know, as, as I scout for deer, the way you, you assess a property for tree management is very similar to the way I assess a property for where I'm going to hunt. I start with an aerial and then I, yeah, I, I ground study it, you know, to see if what my anticipation is based off of what I saw are accurate or inaccurate, or is it, is it still good? It's just not quite exactly what I thought it would be. Um, and then I'm thinking about some of the places that I've been that I know were clear cut initially that have now grown up to be that six to eight foot tall, brambly thick stuff that you can't even walk through, but the deer go there to sleep. Yeah. And they love that. Um, and then there's, I don't know, maybe you can tell me cause you're the forester, but there's that in between stuff where it's still thick but it's more. It's grown up higher than that. It's now twelve feet, thirteen feet yep. tall. And then there's the the forest. It seems like it hasn't been cut in a hundred years. It's just mostly open, easy walking, flat, no brambly stuff in between. Those are the three yep. di- different phases. Uh, you know, excluding swamps where the trees grow. That's kind of what I generally see. Like three different types of terrain. Yep. And how how do we assess that as far as Hunters that are hunting public property, for example, can you make some assumptions based off of deer deer movement and travel inside of those forests? You can. I mean, at the second stage of growth you're talking about for a forested setting is where a forest has reached, a, you know, it, it, say a clear cut was put in and it gets about seven, eight years old. That's about the point where most forests in the U.S. and where average rainfalls a certain amount, uh, they reach ex- what we call stem exclusion, where it shades the 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 trees actually start to canopy, mm-hmm. and they shade the ground, and about it's about eight years, seven eight years, where it it creates an environment where nothing grows underneath it. Um, so for the public land hunter, and I know I, I hunted for I lived in New Hampshire for um, um, about ten years, eleven years, okay. and hunted all over New Hampshire, a lot of public land. Yep. Um, it is difficult to make calls on things with I shouldn't say this, or let me say this. If you have the ability to manipulate the forest, you could, you should do that. Okay. If you don't, you can start looking 
if in a public land setting at that same assessment I was talking about. And one of the nuances I really try to focus on is topography. Okay. Topography helps as much, if not more, than composition because I also know that in a setting like that, the forests are very similar no matter where you go. There's, there's small nuances to the differences. If you can find a recently disturbed area that has been harvested or there's some small difference to it um, that makes it attractive to deer, obviously focus on that. But one of the best things you can start to look for is areas you know have good bedding cover because it's got thick areas. That's the number one thing I would look for, whether it's a cattail swamp or red maple swamp or brushy field or power line right away that hasn't been cut back in a couple of years. Mm-hmm. Um, there are places that you can picture that are a brambly thick mess that you, you don't want to walk through right. that you can start to bet your bottom dollar that deer, deer are probably betting there. Are the type of deer that you want to shoot? That's something you can make those calls once you're observing deer or getting cameras on them or whatever. But you, you start to dedicate and locate the areas you feel like deer are likely betting in. Right. Um, and to escape hunting pressure, especially the time of year we're talking about right now. Then you start to look for topography differences coming out of those areas that might be slight bottlenecks of where deer might travel. Uh, and then you go ground truth those and start looking for trails that actually so show that kind of sign. One of the best things you can start looking for for current sign, obviously, is some buck sign, but um, you know, scrapes, rubs, those kind of things. But right. if you can find a lot of fresh piles of pellets, yep. uh, that that is one of the things I'll key in on in New Hampshire than, than more so than buck sign, because if I'm finding a pretty consistent trail, and I know that for most people listening to this, if you're not in New Hampshire, it's hard to visualize, but that looks very different in parts of the country where a heavy trail looks like, you know, a cattle trail, where in New right. Hampshire, it might really only be a very yes. thin layer of, of leaves that look a little bit flatter than in other areas. Right. But you're finding fresh pellets pretty consistently on that trail. I would focus on that because although you might not find much buck sign, if there is consistent deer use, when we're talking about the rut and the time that you'd probably be going in to hang and hunt anyway, mm-hmm. you're going to be seeing more consistent deer usage. Okay. Um, seems kind of an oddball thing to be looking for, but that, that is something I would focus on. Well, it's an interesting point because if you haven't traveled to other parts of the country, if you're from New Hampshire, if you're if you're not from New Hampshire and you travel to New Hampshire, you start to see different patterns. Uh, and and mm-hmm. that trail is light in New Hampshire. That same trail in Ohio is a beat down highway. You know, it's a it's, very different world. It's a different <laughs> world. Um, yeah. But also hunting outside of the, the some of the states where there are lesser denser less dense populations of deer, you also start to understand the difference between a really big buck and a younger buck and a really young yeah. deer. You know, you can start to see like, oh, that's what the pellets look like in a monster buck. You don't, yeah. you can't really assess that unless you've seen it. And you know, you could be looking for a long time for a monster buck in New Hampshire. They're definitely out there, but it's not quite as prevalent as like Maryland or Ohio or and, Iowa. Yes, and that's why you keep realistic expectations based on your skill level one. Right. Your, you know, desirability and where, you know, where you, where on the ladder you may fall and what you've killed in the past, but two, where you're hunting. Um, my expectations will change depending on what stand, not necessarily what stand I'm sitting in, but that's kind of metaphorically. If I'm hunting in my buddy's property in Kentucky, or if I'm hunting behind my house here in New York, or if I go up to New Hampshire and hunt with a forester friend up there on public land, my expectations of what I want to shoot is going to change based on right. where I'm hunting. Very much so. You know, obviously, I still have my own personal goals, but at the same time, it varies based on what part of the world you're hunting in for sure. Gotcha. As far as the trees that are that are out there that we see the most or we can consider trees, I guess, um, you know, I think about beech. I think about elm. I think about um, oaks couple different types of oaks, the maples, uh, spruce, hemlock, pine trees. Um, should we evaluate that as if we have some land to play with as to should there be a, a good mix of a different variety of trees? 
Yeah, that, that's also a great question, Jay. Uh, one of the things that I was thinking but didn't mention a few minutes ago was when you're talking about selectively picking trees out, there's two major systems that I like to talk about You know, when I get into a forestry discussion with somebody where it's through silviculture, the science of actually trying to grow certain trees. Um, it's based on sunlight, really. So under the even-aged management, that's one system. Then there's uneven age management. That's another. Even age management is where you cut an area hard and you try to regenerate trees that like sun, like in a clear cut or a seed tree cut or a shelter would cut. Seed tree and shelter wood cuts are like a, a clear cut, but instead of doing it all at once, you do it in like two or three stages where you're removing it in you take like 60% of the trees at once and then you go back and you remove the remaining uh, percentages either in once or tw two entries. But the purpose of that is to, to regenerate sun loving trees. And that's where you're going to grow things that are shade uh, intolerant. They do really well in sun like cherry, uh, maple, um, white pine, oak is an intermediate. It does well in sun, but can do pretty good in shade. So you would try to regenerate things like that. Un uneven age management is where you're trying to generate, regenerate multiple age classes in the forest. There's always going to be deer, um, deer uh, trees of different ages, and that's generally going to, to regenerate intermediate to shade liking trees um, and things like hemlock and beech, sugar maple. Um, they like shade. So you can start to like play the history, uh, chronological history of a property by walking around and looking at what trees are there and seeing what, what species are growing there and kind of get a sense of how long ago was this open. You can also see how limmy the trees are. If, the, if there's trees that are very limmy, you knew they grew in a lot of sun. Um, so in terms of desirability, what do you want? So in the north, I always, one of the biggest limiting factor is our winters. Um, so beyond, you know, mentioning earlier, looking for bedding areas, places that deer want to bed, if I'm looking at an aerial photo, right. I also try to identify wintering areas, deer, where deer want to be in the worst of the winter. And what research out of UNH and some other North, Northeastern schools found that, uh, some of the best wintering cover for deer are where you have a pretty closed canopy of coniferous trees, 65, 70% crown closures, meaning if you look up, you know, less than 30% of the sky is open. Um, most of it's covered by live needles and trees that are at least 30 to 35 feet tall. That takes some doing to grow that. I mean, it's everywhere in New Hampshire, that kind of situation I'm talking about, yep. but it's because of the just sheer amount of forest that's there, but deer like places that have a good canopy closure, um, and we can get into a whole deer wintering area discussion if you want, but it gives them better places to, to go during the winter. So I try to locate situations on a property in the Northeast where somebody's interested in managing deer and allocate some areas that are sizable. You know, if I can get them to th three to five acres in size or more um, and c try to limp them along if they're not, if they don't look that way over time to create a good little wintering area for deer on, or, or if there one exists near the property, that's where you get that through that aerial assessment. If one exists on protected land that will never be cut just outside, you don't need to provide it, but you try to make those decisions at, at that ground level. So that that's important. And some of the best species for that white pine is not the best it, it can do, um, but they have pretty wispy branches and needles. They don't hold a good snow load that well. Um, but hemlock, and cedar are pretty desirable for uh, uh, same thing with balsam fir that's that's up there um but hemlock and cedar are probably some of the better species so i try to try to locate those um then for any of the hardwood uh, or deciduous trees that drop their leaves one of the things that you start categorizing any of those trees as you know are they producing a mast source a food source from the top of the tree um, doesn't always have to be acorns. Obviously, beech nuts are something that's produced. Um, cherry trees actually produce a very short-term soft mass, cherries that'll drop out of the tree. So you try to decide, are these trees providing something for wildlife, for deer that are going to fall out of the canopy? How much of it is there? And is it going to really be a primary food source? And then if not, is the tree valuable timber-wise? And if 
not, or if that's not the objective, I start to play play down the Rolodex are of if I cut this tree, what's the benefits of it? Will it sprout? You know, at the ground level, will it allow more sunlight to come down um, and, and let more plants regenerate on the on the forest floor and start trying to make that. That's where the decision criteria comes in of how I'm how will I improve the habitat for deer by making decisions on what trees to cut. And that, again, goes back to the discussion about the assessment if I've already made the decision at a high level, at an aerial photo, that I have a bedding area to my north and west, either I'm going to create it by letting a field grow up to, to a brushy early successional area, or I'm going to put a clear cut in there and just let it grow back for the next four or five, six years. And I have plans to put another food source down to my south and east, but I want to dr- really influence deer movement between points A and B, you can start to go through and make decisions on what trees to cut to make a corridor of of growth on the property kind of influence deer to, to use this one channel. Because you know what, I've selectively cut 50% of the trees or 30% of the trees. And the ones I chose to cut are trees that when they stump or root sprout, they're, they're foods that deer want because there's going to be all these sprouts coming out of the ground. And I left, you know, the trees I left were made up primarily of oaks and beech, which means there are nuts going to be dropping down here. Over time, you will influence travel between those points by making those decisions. But those decisions are made at 10,000 feet up. You make those decisions off an aerial and then you implement at the ground level. And that's where you, gotcha. you go and do that. Okay. There's a lot of people that will just get on their four-wheeler and go out and say, I saw a deer over here last season. I'm going to hinge cut or I'm going to cut a bunch of trees down over here because it's going to make it so much better. But they miss a step. You, you don't make those decisions at the ground level. You make those decisions at an aerial level and implement at the ground level based on how you want to influence deer movement. Gotcha. Okay. So there's a lot of times just hacking it in, in a sense. It's just a, it's better to start way, way above and plan it out that way. Map it. Map, Map your hunt. Yeah. Okay. Now we, we're talking about manipulation of the forest. Um, you know, when you have a food plot, that's like quick or you know seasonal manipulation, human manipulation of uh, of attractant foods. But the, the, is this type of plan instantaneous? And instantaneous, I mean, inside of a year, or is this? Does this go longer than that, where it takes eight to ten years for a, a, some habitat to grow? Because growing, obviously, growing trees takes a heck of a lot longer than growing a food plot. Um, what what type of – is there a, a long-term plan that you should be thinking about, or is it all short-term, um, cut down the canopy in a certain way um, in a, in a, inside of a 12-month period? I think uh, the mental – uh, kind of perspective that you want to have on it is that this is, and I, I'm stealing a phrase from a very close friend and, and a colleague, Dr. Craig Harper, who's well known in kind of the habitat management world, okay. but he calls it a lifestyle. Um, it, and it's an, uh, it is accurate. You, you make this decision, you go out there every year and you do a little bit more and a little bit more and it never stops. There's always something you can do. So in terms of and that's what we're, that's what we do. That's who we are. It's, I mean, I'm, I'm, I cut me, I'm bleed, I'll bleed deer hunting. That's, that's who I am. And I'm sure a lot of people that listen to your podcast are the same way. Right. It, it's not about short term. It's just about always being a good steward and conservationist and trying to improve. So some of these decisions, you can make decisions at the forefront that you might not implement for several years, just because based on your time or resources. I mean, I'm, I think I mentioned earlier, I have a young family, you know, I, I, Financially, things like putting food plots in are very difficult at di- different phases. Some people just don't have the means no matter what life stage they're in. Right. Um, so it, it's a lifestyle that you make these decisions and you always try to improve it. Okay. I will say, and I know that I, to my own fault, I, I've mentioned food plot a couple of times just because I know a lot of people understand a food plot, what it is and how it's an attractant. Mm-hmm. But I've seen, and, and very excitedly so, people across – the country recognize the importance of naturally manipulating the habitat and the value that it gives deer and how it actually provides the same, if not better structure and food to deer than food plots can just by creating early successional cover. 
I personally know of a landowner, uh, we're talking about North Carolina earlier, in the state of North Carolina, it's a pretty large property and it's a person that has good means, but had, you know, dozens of acres of food plots, um, 30, 40, 50 acres of food plots. It's a big property. I'm talking about like a 3,000 acre property and had a hard time growing deer of size. I mean, it was above average for the area, but didn't really meet what his expectations were. And through the guidance of Har- Craig Harper and some uh, hard work, th- that person doesn't actually have any food plots on his property anymore, even though he has the means to do as much as he would want and has managed strictly open areas in early successional cover. Those areas that have, if you can picture it, goldenrod and Joe pie weed and raspberries and just all of this broad leaved brambly, thick mess and the deer get the cover that they want to bed in and the food too that that rivals a lot of food plots that guy's now growing boone and crockett bucks on his property and if you if you don't believe me um I'm not saying that you don't but if if you go on qdma's facebook page mm-hmm. we live uh streamed several talks from our national convention this past july and craig harper gave a talk and he cites this property this example of a property and uh, you can look, you can watch it because the way Facebook works, it you know saves the video. Yes, right. Go watch his thirty-minute or forty-five-minute talk, and he talks about this property where the guy's gotten away from using food plots, and he's managing strictly under early successional habitat, and has killed that property. Has now produced a Boone and Crockett buck for three years in a row in North Carolina. Fascinating. That's really fascinating, yeah. especially North Carolina. That's yeah. That's so interesting. So. In terms of the time perspective, you know, in terms of cost, there's cost there, but nothing what a food plot would cost. You you cut down, if you have forest, you cut the trees down, you make sure those trees don't reproduce themselves, they don't sprout by using herbicide on the stumps, but the ground, the earth, has billions of seeds in it that want to sprout. Right. You just get sunlight on them and they're going to produce, so you can go out and create an early successional brushy area by cutting trees down and either stumping it, if you have the ability to do that, or putting a little herbicide on the stump so that those stumps die. And the ground will respond with brambles and all kinds of stuff that that Mother Nature wants to grow. And you could do that in pockets around your property to produce little little areas that deer will bed and they're going to be eating in. And again, steer deer movement based on all that, a lot less expensive. There's labor. In terms of time, that type of environment takes a couple seasons to grow. I mean, you're not going to get, that's just succession. Um, The first year you're going to get grasses, but usually by years three and four, you're going to get a pretty good environment that's ideal. And you always have to manage it. You're going to get species in there that grow that you don't want. Um, You might get invasive non-native plants. And that's certainly something you should take stock in. If there's a lot of things like honeysuckle or barberry or up in your neck of the woods, um, uh, buckthorn. There's other things that'll grow in some of those plot, plots or these openings that you'll need to, to mechanically get out of there, use herbicide, whatever you, you can. But that's why it's a lifestyle. You're, you're always out there doing something. Yep. Gotcha. Very interesting stuff. Uh, just I don't think we've discussed this type of deer strategy in this context before. So this, this has been enlightening. On the QDMA site, it uh, looks like you write a series of articles. And the you started writing, writing a, a series called Know Your Deer Plants. And I've been kind of poking around on this. It's kind of fascinating. Can we go over some of the, some of the different types of plants that you consider deer plants that you wrote about? Uh, sure, yeah. I think I know the the article you wrote you're referring yeah, to. Yeah, there's several. Um, I, yeah, it looks like there's several. The first one was back in 2012, and it was called Beggar's Lice. Yeah. I used to um, write a column in our magazine. Our magazine is called Quality White Tales. People, our, our members get it every other month. And I think I wrote that column for seven years, and a lot of those uh, profiles are, were pulled out of that series. I used to write two for every issue, so 12, 12 yeah. profiles a year. Yeah. And uh, I don't know, I'm probably 50, 60 profiles that I wrote, but yeah. Yeah, it's a uh, ho- what, what? horse mint, uh, partridge pea, American plum, devil's walking stick, Allegheny uh, chinkapin. There's great names. I've never heard of these things before. Um, a lot of those are southern to mid-south, the ones okay. you mentioned. Okay. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, the swamp chestnut oak. Yep. So we have those. Okay. American beach. I, I mean, that's, that's around, that's all over yeah. the place, right? Oh yeah. So do, do these writing this, this series, were these key foods that deer will eat in certain areas of the country that you felt necessary to explore more? Sometimes, and, and I shouldn't say sometimes, the majority were that plant produced something that deer liked and I wanted to make sure that our members knew how to identify it and knew the value of it. Um, when you do something for that many years and you need to come up with that many profiles, occasionally I would talk about plants that were not good for deer and here's why and here's how you identify it. So it varied depending on what they were and that's why it was called Know Your Plants. It's just uh, kind of a recommendation of how to identify things. I will say I understand for most people that are you know, average hunter landowners that look out in the forest, they probably can identify some trees um, with leaves on. It might be a little bit more difficult. Leaves aren't on. If it's a shrub or something that's not a tree, it's a lot more difficult. Um, and it seems very, uh, a very difficult task to talk about going out and identifying those and, you know, having like a field guide and who's really going to do that. I mean, it's it's difficult. But I will say, probably to really break it down for most people, one of the best things you can do, besides trying to look at, so it's probably you even got a little bit of a glazed look on your eyes when you started reading those names off to, to yeah. the uh, listeners, right? It's You're like, absolutely whoa. right. I'm, you can you see know, there's, me somehow through the mic. Yeah. Right. I mean, there's hundreds and hundreds of plants out there. I mean, there's, and there's like literally six or 700 plants that deer have been cataloged that they've eaten. You know, it's, you're not going to know them all and you don't need to. What you need to do as a, listener to Jay's podcast here is if you can go out there and identify the 10 most common trees that you see Mm -hmm. where you hunt, or even you can even lower that number to five, but if you could pick 10 most 10 trees that you see the most commonly and the 10 most common shrubs, things that aren't trees that are, that are, that don't grow in a tree form and you know how to identify them and you know what good they are for deer or if they're not, that is basically all you really need to know because if you live in, you know, southern New Hampshire or eastern New York, you know, you're really only going to grow X number of species. You don't need to know devil's walking stick. You'll never see that plant, um, you know, for anybody that's listening in that part of the country. Um, what you want to know is what's growing there right now, what's good for deer, what's not. So learn how to identify not just any plant, but the ones you see. Go out there and say, all right, what's this one? What's this? I see this one every, what is it? And come up with 10 of them. And then try to find out if that's a good plant for deer or not. If it's not, you can start to decide as you're doing your manipulations, I want to get rid of that one. Um, you know, here's an example. Elm, you mentioned American elm earlier. Yes. Elm as a tree that's been cut and is producing sprouts at the ground level generally is a favored deer browse. But when the tree grows and it's above a deer's reach, it doesn't do anything for deer. It doesn't produce anything that deer want out of the canopy. It takes up space. An elm tree is better for deer if it's cut and it's either sprouting and it's pr- sprouting from the stump or if it's eliminated. The The browse it produces is pretty good. It has some good value nutritionally, but it is not as good as if you had a pokeweed plant or a raspberry plant or a um, goldenrod or something growing there that's that's a low forb. A forb is a, a non-woody broadleaf plant growing in its place. So you start making those decisions based on what you know. Are you, is the average hunter going to know all that stuff? No, but you only need to figure it out for what's growing there. So my recommendation is get a good ID book or an app on your phone mm-hmm. that has good photos and try to identify the 10 most common trees and the 10 most common shrubs on your property. Um, if you do that, you're, you're doing pretty good. Okay, so let's say let's say you're just walking into a property, and you if you know these twenty things, the twenty trees, twenty shrubs, and you start to see that there's an abundance of certain ones, can you extrapolate from that? This is probably good deer habitat. Um, yeah, you can based on. I, mean, I, I know every deer hunter knows if you're seasoned, and you know if you've got a couple seasons on your belt. If you're walking on into a new pu- property, public or private land that you're about to hunt, and you get a feeling that, ooh, this is, hold on a second, this is pretty deery. 
You know, you got a feeling right. like it's deer. You, know, you might not even be seeing deer sign, but you're like, wow, I, I would not be surprised if I jump a deer in the next minute right. because you start recognizing that structure, those species, what plants are there and reproduce it, <laughs> you know, figure out what's growing there. Um, so if you, if you gave me a description of age and species composition of an area on a property, I could tell you whether or not deer are using that. Sure. Um, but you don't need to be a licensed forester to do that. Most deer hunters understand it. Yep. You know, if they're walking in a space that doesn't feel like they might bump a deer, if you can actually identify the trees that are growing there. So I'll tell you this, or let me ask you a question. We'll turn the interview around. <laughs> okay. If you're walking through a forest and it's primarily hemlock, very uh, shaded, yeah. there's occasionally, there's pine trees, white pine in the mix, but a lot of hemlock, some red maple. Um, maybe a little ash, a lot of needles on the ground. You can see 60, 70, 80 yards ahead of you. Do you expect to jump a deer in, let me, let me pick a time of year, in the, you know, deer season? Deer season, if you can see 80 yards in that, that cover? Yeah. Eh, probably not. Maybe, but probably not. I agree. Right. That serves a purpose during the summer. It's a nice, cool spot for deer. We'll probably spend some time there in the summer. Because it's if it's hot out, it'll be cooler in that setting, or they'll be in there in the winter for what we talked about before. Right. But th that's one of the cool things about forestry and forest management plans is you, uh, the natural resource professional that creates your management plan, it will create a compartment map and do descriptions for each stand. I can read through a forestry management plan and kind of identify the areas where deer will be already based on that description. But. Um, I, I, I urge folks not to get overly technical. Um, you know, one of the easiest things you can do is the process of doing an assessment from an aerial photo and taking those steps that we talked about earlier down yep. to the point where you're making decisions and don't get overwhelmed. Pick one project at a time, you know, maybe design or landscape the property in a way that you have yourself a couple different entry routes, a couple different wind directions, you know, don't, don't get too crazy. But, and then if those projects take two years to complete or three, that's what it takes. Right. But, you know, chip away at it. That's what a management plan that's is. That's it. All right. It becomes a lifestyle, as you mentioned. It becomes a lifestyle. Correct. Very good. All right. Now, let's move Copyright on. Copyright Craig Harper, 2017. <laughs> exactly. Let's move on, Matt. And uh, I asked in the beginning, I asked you to think of a memorable deer story. And uh, I've given you uh, a little bit of time to kind of think about it as you're speaking to us about landscaping a, a property. And what, All right. What do you got? You want, Where are we going to go? A, a memorable deer story. All right. Well, I haven't given it too much thought, but I'll, I'll tell you one that just popped in my mind since we're talking about. Perfect writing for quality white tails or magazine and QDMA. Um, it's probably 2000. So I, I hunt a couple of different places in New York. I have seven acres and actually behind my prop, my, my house is a public land. It's a County forest that I can hunt on. So I hunt there. Um, but I do most of my hunting in a little bit more agriculturally rich area. It's only 20 minutes from my house and I hunt on a co-op um, uh, for, farms. One's a beef farm, three dairy farms that, um, you know, I help kind of form and one's a very close, my, my best friend is part of one of those farms. And, uh, we, in the beginning of forming this co-op, they had historically done very little doe harvests, um, before that co-op existed. They, they really just didn't shoot does and we needed to shoot a lot of them. And, uh, this goes back to 2012, I think, or 13. So about five years ago. Um, we were starting to grow some, it was about the third year of the co-op. So we we're starting to see some bucks of age on the property. Um, but we also had this, me personally, because I felt like it was on my shoulders, uh, a high expectation to shoot a lot of does. We were trying to shoot 35 does, I think, that year off of 1,700 acres. Four, four farms, 35 does. And it had about, uh, I'm not certainly not the only hunter there. There was about 20 five hunters i think they'll hunt those four farms um so i it was mid-season actually i think it was may have been late late in the season and uh i had shot one or two does already i think maybe it was one that year but i i knew we needed a long long hill to climb to meet our doe harvest quota so i went to a, a field that had been recently showing there was a lot of deer activity in it they were coming in and feeding it was like early december and uh 
my goal was to go and shoot a doe. And that's what I wanted to do because I wanted to kind of help the farmer out. We, we had these expectations. I got there and I positioned myself and about the time I had been seeing deer, I'd been hunting another part of the field and uh, been seeing a lot of activity in this one corner. Um, so I said, you know, I'm going to move and just hunt from the ground uh, and was sitting there and about the time and of the day and uh, the same place of the field I'd been seeing deer, deer started coming out and filtering out and I was getting beat it up on a on a good sized doe um i was laying prone in the middle of the field it was just the way the terrain fit, uh laid mm-hmm. so really to get a shot i actually was out in the field but right behind a little rise and i just was putting all the marbles in one basket that deer would come out of that corner if they came up behind me i'd be like just they'd be looking at me laying in the middle of the field and uh getting ready to shoot this doe and it was with a group of deer and uh I could see she lift her head and kind of snap back and looked over to the corner. And there, sure enough, was a buck that I had photos of, never seen a person. He was coming out to feed, too. And I had to choose at that moment what to do because I could either take the personal, uh, you know, choice and shoot that buck or I could help this farmer out who really wanted to reduce the deer numbers on there. And I've been telling him we need to shoot a lot of does and, uh, you know, I had a hard choice. Do I shoot this three and a half year old buck it was about like mid one twenties or do I shoot the doe that I had a clean shot on right then, right there. And the buck was not really in position yet. So I ultimately ended up deciding to shoot the three and a half year old buck, which most hunters would and decided, I wonder if I could get on back on the doe. And I never did, but, um, that was the first buck I killed on our co-op yeah. and uh, we've killed a lot of really good deer off of there. But I, I guess I'm telling that story to say, Hey, I'm like everybody else. I'm a deer hunter. I wanted, we had been growing deer. I, you know, that was part of the experience. And I, I, I shot the buck and dropped him in his tracks and felt really good. He's actually sitting here, uh, as a, as a mount over my, my desk. So that's, that's the story. <laughs> Excellent and, story. And, and, and as, uh, uh, we did a good job shooting does. We did okay that year, but we, over time, elevated our our harvest to the point where we were able to back out back up and we really are shooting a fraction of the does that we were in the first couple of years because the deer herd's really really in balance and uh it's good it's a good experience that's cool very cool excellent all right matt i've got 10 rapid fire questions for you i uh, right. i kind of prepped you for these but i haven't told you what they are so if you're ready i'm ready i'm ready all right what's your number one hunting tip of all time number one hunting tip of all time would be to play the wind um, over anything else. And the way I like to do that is, I don't know if anybody else probably uses some manufactured wind checks, but I, every year at the end of the summer, as uh, things are starting to dry up, will find myself a couple of um, milkweed pods and I let them dry out and I keep those in my hunting sack and uh, use milkweed. That's a great one. I've heard that a couple times now, but uh, that's, it's, it's a great way to check the wind. Love that one. Yep. All right. Uh, we all have these things that we can't hunt without. and We go into the woods and we leave it at home. It drives us crazy because we don't have it with us. What's that one thing for you? Binoculars. Binoculars. Very common answer. I, I, I rarely forget them, but if I do, it's not fun. I, I keep them in my driver's side door uh, at all times of the year. So when I get out to hunt, they usually go right on my driver's seat as I'm getting all my gear on or I'll throw them in the, in the, on the tailgate as I jump out. So, you know, there's always those mornings that you're running late and I get out and get to my tailgate and get my pack and whatever. And I start walking, get to the stand like, oh, they're still sitting in my door. (laughs) Yep. Uh, I know the feeling. Yep. All right. What's your biggest pet peeve in life? My biggest pet peeve in life? Hmm. Probably um, people that don't follow up. Somebody says they're going to do something. Don't do it. Right. Gotcha. Very good. How old are you today? I am 41. 41. What would you tell the 20-year-old Matt Ross, knowing what you know today? Ooh, you got a uh, a great life ahead of you. Nice. All right. <laughs> Very good. All right. You uh, you meet a stranger at a hunting convention somewhere in the world, and they come up to you and they ask you what you do for a living. What do you tell them? I usually tell them I'm a, a deer biologist or wildlife biologist, I guess. That's usually the the thing that I go to. It's a lot easier than saying assistant director of conservation. (laughs) Gotcha. All right. What did you have for breakfast this morning? I had a banana and peanut butter and a cup of coffee. Very nice. Excellent. You get your own billboard on the side of a highway. It's a blank canvas. You can put anything you want on it. What would it say? 
don't shoot young bucks. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, You're welcome. I, uh, if I say the word successful to you, who's the first person that pops into your head and why? Successful. Yeah. Um, probably, I mean, I don't know if he's going to listen to this, but Kip Adams. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I, I, try to, I try to emulate a lot of uh, what I've done in a career after Kip. He's, he's a well-put-together person. Gotcha. Very good. What's a day in your life look like? Day in my life looks like. So I have a five-year-old that just started kindergarten and three-year-old, two daughters. Mm-hmm. Uh, my wife works uh, not full-time, but she works four days a week. So most mornings I get my uh, five-year-old on the bus and my uh, younger daughter to daycare. Mm-hmm. I am sitting at my desk working uh, at home. I work from home and uh, get a lot of a lot of work done during the day when nobody's here, when when family's around it's a little bit more difficult but uh usually my daughter gets off the bus and uh we we talk about her day and have dinner when my wife and my other daughter get home she picks her up and get to be around my family quite a bit that's an average day there are times of the year where i travel quite a bit okay um luckily i get to plan when that is based on uh my own schedule and when our members want stuff done and i luckily don't travel that much in november so i'm i've been home a lot in the fall i typically am very cool. And and finally, what's a typical deer hunting day in your life look like? A typical deer hunting day in my life, whew, it's been different with kids, I will say. Um, mm-hmm. Typically, I'm, I'm hunting on a weekend in this stage of my life. Uh, I try to get out uh, during the week, um, but most of my trips to my the property is I'm hunting is 20 minutes. It's a truck drive, and I'm either getting there for a morning hunt and I'm coming back or... Uh, most of my hunts are afternoon, so I'm work, getting my daughter on the on the bus. I'm working in the morning. About lunchtime, I shoot down to the property if I can, um, have a stand picked out based on whatever wind direction it's going in and whether or not I'm really trying to shoot a doe or a particular buck, and uh, very strategic. I, I pick my hunts on the days when I think the conditions are the best and in the areas of the property that I feel like I have the best shot. Very cool. All right. Excellent. Well, those are the 10 rapid fire questions. I appreciate your good ones answering those. And uh, Matt, so we talked about a lot, a lot of different subject matters, um, all the way from uh, tree canopy to the meaning of the QDMA and how it started. If we haven't answered questions or if we've created other questions from the, the answers that we've, we've asked or the questions we've asked today, where can we find more information about you or the QDMA? Well, the easiest place to go to is QDMA's website, which is simply QDMA.com. Um, we have a, certainly a large following on social media. You can find all those outlets through our homepage, but um, the QDMA website is the place to be, and we have that updated pretty much daily. Um, every other, if not every day, there's new articles or information going on the website. Um, you can reach me. I'm uh, located on that website, either under our staff menu or under some of the programs that I oversee, like our deer steward uh, class. That's the training I mentioned a couple times. Mm -hmm. Um, There's a whole deer steward menu uh, on our main page, but I'll just tell folks you can get me at mross, M-R-O-S-S. That's my first initial last name at qdma.com. I'm happy to answer anybody's questions. And there's also an ask the expert menu option on our homepage too. And depending on what question it is, particularly if it's forestry or habitat uh, related, it'll end up on my in my inbox or for one of my staff to answer. So that's a pretty good chance to find me as well. But if you have any questions regarding deer biology, QDM, uh, managing properties, or anything related to deer hunting in general in terms of techniques and the research that we do and what QDMA does, you can contact us through that Ask the Expert or Contact Us button, and there's a variety of staff that answers those questions basically the day that we get them if we, we can. So it's a good way to reach out to us. All right. Very good. Right, Matt, this has been an honor and a pleasure to have you on the show. I've learned a lot today listening to you, and I'm sure I'll have some other questions down the road for you if that's cool. But uh, just Absolutely. Fantastic interview, and thank you so much for spending the last hour and uh, almost two, uh, hour and a half uh, talking about the stuff that, that you uh, live and breathe every day. Oh, you're welcome. And I, I'll just make one more plug for our organization. If any listeners are out there, if you're a deer hunter um, and you feel passionate about your uh, exploits deer hunting and what you do and you feel like it's a right that we all have, 
Um, it's true, but it's certainly not something that is given to us. Um, you know, there's a lot of citizens out there that are not hunters. In fact, um, very, very uh, few people are deer hunters or hunters in general. There's a lot of the public that makes those decisions that we ha- we can hunt. So join QDMA, join conservation uh, a conservation group that kind of oversees what your interests are. If you're a duck hunter or turkey hunter or gun owner, there's groups for all of those. But if you're a deer hunter, please join QDMA. Um, we need your we need your power. We need the numbers out there for us to be able to go do those things. And it's only $35 a year. So, and you get a great magazine with it. So I, I hope folks that aren't deer hunters or that are deer hunters that aren't members that are listening to this will join after this interview. Well, thanks to Matt Ross for joining us on the Big Buck Registry Deer Hunting Podcast. I do appreciate his time and uh, exploring all those things that have to do with deer habitat and tree cutting and uh, certainly had a, a lot of connections there and I, I learned a lot and uh, know a lot more about the QDMA than I ever knew and uh, certainly going to use some of Matt's suggestions to a find deer and it'd be if, uh, if I ever have a piece of property use use his advice to trim the trees as we see fit to improve deer habitat focus a little bit on the the doe to buck ratios Dusty, do we have a Chubby Tines Tip of the Week this week? No, we do, Jay. It- the Chubby Tines Tip of the Week is sponsored by Morse's Sporting Goods. Firearms, use firearms, bows, use bows. Located at 85 Kentucky Falls Road in Hillsborough, New Hampshire. Give Jim a call at 603-464-3444, morse'ssportinggoods.com. Your dollars go further in New Hampshire. There's no sales tax. Morse's Sporting Goods. Uh, it, it comes down to... Uh- your landowners, you know, they're they're taking care of you and by allowing you to hunt their land, uh, you know, take care of them. The holidays are upon us, and if it's just a, a simple little fruit basket, goes a long way with your landowners. There you go. That's a great, great idea. Very, very nice. It's that time of year to give back to some of the landowners that generously let you hunt on them, and uh, it's it's kind of hard for us to do that in New Hampshire because there's so much vast land, and the, the land use rights are a little different, but they're still posted pieces of property that we get permission to hunt on that's when you want them to go say thank you so how i there's nothing that you could do as a hunter i don't think if you hunt on private land and you need to that helps that relationship continue yeah for sure awesome awesome tip man dusty where can we find you when you're not hanging out here in the studios with me uh, shoot me an email dusty at big buck com. you can look me up on instagram and twitter at chasing antler facebook.com forward slash chubby tines outdoors jay where can the people reach out to you or you're not on the mic likewise you can shoot me an email jay at big buck com, and you can visit us on facebook facebook.com forward slash big buck registry we're also on twitter which is twitter.com forward slash big buck registry we are also on instagram instagram.com forward slash big buck registry and youtube which is youtube.com forward slash big buck registry on youtube you can listen to all of our podcasts in their entirety as far as videos are concerned, it's a boring video, but the audio content is there, so you can actually listen to our podcast. You can also listen to all of our live shows that we've done on Thursday nights when we do do them, and we've gone back and interviewed, re-interviewed a lot of our previous guests we had on the show just to put a face to a voice, let's put it that way. You can always listen to our show on other places as well, not just YouTube. We're found on iTunes, iHeartRadio, TuneIn Radio, Stitcher, and Blueberry. And if you would like to submit a buck to our page for consideration and be featured on our page in front of 250,000 diehard deer hunting fans, all you have to do is go to bigbuckredstreet.com forward slash my buck, and all of the instructions will be right there. I think that's pretty much everywhere we're at. I think that's a wrap, Dusty. That's a whole lot of big buck, Jay. Sure is. I'm Jay Scott. I'm Dusty Phillips. And this is the Big Buck Registry's Deer Hunting Podcast. We'll see you next week. Yeah.